The title of the message is, uh, what is it, y'all? When Things Heat Up. That wasn't my title, but that's a good one, too. My title is God is Able. Same thing. So I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel, the third chapter. Very familiar story, the fiery furnace. Daniel, the third chapter, I will begin reading at the eighth verse. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said unto Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You yourself, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whosoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up. Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you will not worship, you will immediately be cast into mist of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hands, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Back up a little bit. King Nebuchadnezzar was full of himself. Not only was he worshiping pagan gods, false gods. He wanted people in his kingdom to worship him. So he made this golden image, 90 feet tall and nine feet wide and put it out in the middle of the desert. So when the people heard the sound of the music, they would have no excuse to face the image, bow down and worship. To back up even further, chapter one of the book of Daniel tells us that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked Jerusalem and was victorious. He instructed his chief to take some of the young men captive. But he didn't just want any kind of men. He wanted men of royalty. 
from noble families, healthy, good looking, and smart because he wanted to use them for service in his palace. Among these young men selected were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now these four men decided they weren't going to defile themselves or pollute their bodies by eating the food that was prepared for them by the king. They convinced the man in charge to allow them to be tested. Let us eat vegetables, and after the test, you make the decision. You determine whether we look healthy or not. So after this test period, these four men appeared healthier and better nourished than any of the other men who ate the prepared food. Not only that, but any time the king had questions about anything, he found that these four men were better qualified to answer the questions, even more so than his magicians and wise men. In the second chapter of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar has this vision, this dream that greatly troubles him. He called his magicians and wise men, instructed them first, tell me my dream. And then after you tell me my dream, I want you to interpret it for me. Daniel was the only one able to do what the king had asked. So what goes wrong in chapter 3? These four young men have pleased the king. They have been promoted. They are now in charge of the men that used to be in charge of them. What happened? Now understand now we're in this story we're dealing with the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel has his own ordeal that comes up later when he's thrown into the lion's den. But we're going to try to answer three questions. Number one, how did they get there? How did they get in this terrible situation? Or as we might say, why me? You know, we have a tendency to believe that, you know, if we come to church, if we come to Sunday school, if we study our Bible, if we put some money in the plate, we have a tendency to just think that we're immune to problems. That somehow because we've been so good, that somehow God owes us something. You know, we've crossed our T's and dotted our I's. So when trouble comes, the first question we have is, why me? Why not you? Jesus promised in this world we're going to have trouble, so why are we so confused when trouble comes? As long as we're in this world, we're going to have trouble. So the question is not, why am I in it? The question is, how am I going to respond to it? And that's the second question. How did they respond to the situation? And the third question, why did they respond in the way that they responded? Question one, how did they get in this terrible situation? It could have been jealousy. You know, these are new kids on the block. You know, the people that had been in place in the palace servicing the king were now pushed to the side. And these new kids are now in their positions. So it could have been jealousy. Soon as they saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not worshiping the golden image, they ran and told the king. It could have been 
arrogance on the part of these young men. You remember Joseph, who was given the coat of many colors, the dreamer. You know, he had the dream and went to his brothers and his father and told them both, all of them, that one day you guys are going to bow down and worship me. I mean, he's a 16-year-old kid. Arrogance. Or it could be no one's fault at all. In John, the ninth chapter, first few verses, Jesus and his disciples encounter a man that's blind from birth. So the question the disciples had, who has sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus said neither, but it has happened that the work of God may be displayed in him. So sometimes situation happens and we don't have nothing to do with it. We learn that from Job. Job didn't know what was going on. Job didn't have the book of Job to read. God just decided to use Job to bring glory and honor to himself. So a lot of times, we ha what happens to us is for God to get the glory. When we look back at the beginning of the story, when Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem and was victorious, the Bible tells us that it was God that gave him the victory. In other words, God set up the whole thing. That's what we mean when we talk about the sovereignty of God, that God is in control. Nothing happens unless God sends it or allows it. In the furnace, the fiery furnace, even though the king turned it up seven times hotter, God controlled the temperature. Again, we learn from the story of Job that Satan was limited in what he could do to Job. So the question is not how did they get in the situation or how did we get in our situation. The real question is, I'm in it, so how I'm going to deal with it? Jesus promised in this world you're going to have trouble. Now how are we supposed to deal with these troubles? Let us learn from the three Hebrew boys. Question two, how did they respond in their situation? With trust. Verse 17, if it be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hands, O king. Trust. They responded with trust, knowing that the God whom they serve was able to deliver, able to protect, able to make a way out of no way, able to supply their every need. They were able to trust him because of what he had always done in the past. To paraphrase verse 15 and 16, verse 15 says, now if you, be, you are ready. In other words, King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he liked these guys. You know, they had done some good things for him, so he enjoyed them being around his palace. So he said, I'm going to give you another chance. That's basically what he's saying in, in verse 15. 
Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply, we don't need another chance because another chance will have the same results. We're still not going to worship your God and bow down to your image. So who woke you up this morning? Who put food on your table? I always tell my Sunday school class that they, they need to start journaling. You know, write down the blessings of God. Because what happens is God blesses us so much that we forget the blessings. We forget the blessings. It's all about, you know, okay, what have you done for me lately? But we forget all the past blessings. You know, if, if God blessed me in 78, if God blessed me in 92, if God blessed me in 2001, if God blessed me in 2006, when I get to 2012, I know in God's timing, he's going to bless me again. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. So if he blessed me here, blessed me here, blessed me here, blessed me here, in the midst of my mess, in the midst of my situation, when God gets ready, he's going to bring me out. So we always have to remember what God has done. As the song says, to God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood, he saved me. With his power, he raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Question three, why did they respond in the way that they did? Where did this kind of trust come from? The trust came from what God had done for his children in the past. God had developed a track record of blessings. You remember Abram before his name was changed to Abraham when he was getting ready to go into this country and they were violent people. And God, Abraham told Sarah, well, when we get in here, tell him your sister. Because, you know, you're a good looking woman. And they're going to desire you. And if they desire you, they're just going to kill me. So just tell them you're my sister. He kind of told a half truth. But in reality, a half truth is still a lie. But the track record that God developed over Abraham's life, where he trusted God more and more and more because God showed himself to be faithful. It became easier and easier for Abraham to trust God because of the track record to the point where he was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac. That's how much he trusted God. Because even in his mind, if you read in Hebrews, even in his mind, Abraham believed that if he sacrificed his son, God had the power to bring him back. That's trust. A few years ago, I heard a story about a gangbanger just, just creating havoc in the city where he lived. But God touched this young man's life to where he gave his life to the Lord. And instead of out there terrorizing people on the street, he began to witness about Jesus Christ. Two years after his conversion, he got killed in a drive-by. Now, he came from a family that was ungodly. Nobody wanted anything to do with religion. Nobody wanted to do anything with church or anything like that. But after this young man was killed, his family, who had saw the change in his life, how God had turned him around, his whole family ended up coming to the Lord. Amen. 
Sounds tragic, but God has a purpose and a plan for everything. I'm saying this. Sometimes the circumstances of life are not to teach us. God is in the business of teaching. God is always teaching. But sometimes the circumstances or the situations that we find ourselves in is for God to teach somebody else. Because God has somebody watching us to see how we respond in certain situations. Just like he used Job, people needed to see how Job responded to the predicaments that he got in. Temptations are common. That's what, what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us. There's no temptation but that is common to man. In other words, what we go through individually, everybody go through the same stuff. God doesn't pick you out. It's common. But then it says that God is faithful, that he will not let us be tempted above which we are able to bear. But with the temptation, allow a way of escape so that we can endure it. What am I saying? I'm saying that everybody that was brought into captivity didn't go along with God's program. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego decided that they weren't going to defile themselves because under Jewish law, they weren't allowed to eat certain kinds of food. But yet, if you read the story, it says after that testing period, after they were able to eat the vegetables, they said that they appeared to be healthier and more nutritious than the other men that ate from the king's table. So what that's saying is that some of the Jews or God's people that came out of Jerusalem into captivity went with the program of the king. They went with the flow. So now the question that I have for you, and you don't have to answer, but the question I have for you, if God has chosen you to have somebody watch you, what are they going to see? Are they going to see a person that's obedient to the things of God, or are they going to see somebody that's going with the flow? That's a question that you can answer in your own time. I don't know, you, you may be in the midst of a fiery furnace right now. Whether he'll bring you out or not, I don't know. But he's able. This I do know. A bad attitude will keep you in the furnace longer than you need to be. The three week, that should have been a three week journey, turned out to be 40 years for the children of Israel. You know, some of us, I hope it don't take us 40 years to get with God's program. I know it takes some of us a while, but believe me, you will get with God's program because the Bible says, he that began a good work in you will carry it out to completion to the day of Christ Jesus. Because you're in this place, God has started something with you and he's going to carry it out to completion. So either you, what's the Midas commercial? Pay me now or pay me later. Get with God's program now or get with it later. But when you get, decide to get with it later, you're going to have all kinds of headaches and bruises and scars. Because God will allow you to get beat up. He will allow you to be in captivity. 
because some of us are hard-headed and the only way we learn something is to knock our head against the wall a few times. God doesn't bring us into his kingdom scratching and screaming. We come into his kingdom by inviting him into our lives. The children of Israel that wandered for 40 years, the Bible says that they didn't enter into the promised land because of unbelief. God has many, many, many promises for his children. And a lot of us don't enter into God's promises because we just choose not to believe. God didn't promise there would be no valleys, but he promised that he'd be in the valley with us. So are you going to focus on your situation? Or are you going to trust God's word when he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you? Are you going to worry about your circumstance? or stand on the promise. And my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God that delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego still delivers the day. Through the storms of life, God is still able through your troubles and struggles, God is still able. In the hospital room, God is still able. In the courtroom, God is still able. In your own personal fiery furnace, God is still able. All these blessings and many more are available to the children of God. The children of God, meaning you have to be in the family. Look what King Nebuchadnezzar found out in verse 28. This is after the, the three Hebrew boys are delivered from the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him. The first three chapters of Genesis talks about the creation, talks about the fall of man. All the rest of the Bible, God is simply trying to get us to do one thing. Trust me. I got this. I got a plan for your life that was laid out from the foundation of the world. I know what you need before you even ask. I got a plan for your life. All through the Bible, that's what he's trying to teach us. I know you want the blessings. So the question is, are you in the family? Preacher, how do you get in the family? All you have to be is a whosoever. The Bible says, whosoever will, let them come. The Bible says, whosoever call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him or trust in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah. 
In a minute, we'll sing the song of response. If you have never received this free gift of salvation, understand that salvation is free, but it wasn't cheap. Jesus paid the price. All to him we owe. And the greatest blessing is achieved when we invite Jesus into our lives. We pass from death to life. He brings us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he asks us to be witnesses for him. If we truly understand just how good God has been to us, doesn't it make sense to tell somebody else about him? That's all he's asked us to do. Let your light shine so that men might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And I always tell people as, as believers, as children of God, we don't have the luxury of just acting any old kind of way. The Bible calls us ambassadors. We represent. So when people look up at us, people that don't know Jesus look at us as believers, and we're not representing the way we should be representing, what kind of effect is that going to have on our Savior? All I'm saying is that in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our troubles, in the midst of our negative situation, God is still able. And our attitude is important. Our attitude is important because even in the midst of our troubles, we can still praise God for what he has already done. You can still lift up your eyes to Calvary, where Jesus hung, where he bled and died for you. Knowing that you have a home prepared, not made with hands. That as children of God, we're going to spend all eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a promise. That song says, with his power... He has raised me. It's talking about the resurrection. God said that we will be resurrected. It's a done deal. Our hope is different from the world's hope. When we talk about hope that God gives, it just means it hasn't happened yet. It's a done deal. It hasn't happened yet. The world's hope is a wish. We ain't wishing for nothing. We know it's going to happen. We're just waiting for Jesus to come back. But until he comes back, we got to be busy about our father's business.